save 10% with my code Bobby10. Just kidding, guys. Today's offer is much greater than a saving of 10%. I teamed up with my Muslim brothers and we created Pure Passage. Imagine sending the reward of Umrah this Ramadan to someone you really loved but had already departed from this dunya. Or they're really sick and they cannot perform Umrah at all. Imagine the feeling of honoring his or her memory and expressing your love and devotion while still ensuring that they receive this gift. The reward of performing Umrah. As a new revert, I just learned about this, but you know better than me that performing Umrah is a profound spiritual journey that most Muslims aspire to undertake and you understand the rewards of it. However, for some, this journey can be challenging, especially when their loved ones are sick or have already passed away. At Pure Passage, we understand how important it is to fulfill this obligation for your loved ones. That's why we offer our professional and reliable service to perform Umrah on behalf of your sick or deceased parents, spouse or any other relatives. We believe that everyone should have the opportunity to fulfill this sacred act even if they are unable to do so themselves and equally understand that the physical and financial challenges of performing Umrah yourself on behalf of your loved ones can be overwhelming. That's where Pure Passage comes in. We take care of everything and make sure that your loved one's Umrah is performed with the utmost care and attention to detail. So let us help you earn this immense reward for your loved ones by performing Umrah on their behalf. Contact us today and let's make it happen. All right, guys, welcome back to the channel. If you're new, my name is Bobby. Guys, today we're going to react to a video that I do not know anything about. This was heavily suggested by you guys. It is Salman El Farsi by the channel Islamic Guidance. So I had to look him up myself. Salman El Farsi, aka Salman the Persian, was a Persian companion, Sahaba of the Islamic prophet Muhammad. May peace be upon him. He was raised as a Zoroastrian in Sasanian Persia, then attracted to Christianity and then converted to Islam after meeting Muhammad in the city of Yathrib which later became Medina. So there you go, the learning already started. This man apparently was a Sahaba that met Prophet Muhammad. May peace be upon him. I'm very curious to find out about his story. With no further ado, let's have a look. I was the son of someone who was called Dihqan. He was the richest person in my city, in my town, and he was the main merchant, and he had some religious duties or some religious role and position. And he loved me so much that he didn't even let me go and mix with people. He kept me at home because he was so worried that something bad might happen to me. So he wanted to protect me from everybody and from every harm. So he kept me at home. He was very deeply involved in what his family was involved in. They were the leaders of the fire worshippers and those who worshipped the sun. They were known as Al Majus. So he used to be in charge as a young boy of keeping the flame alive. So he would bring for it fuel all the time and people worship the flame. And he used to tell himself, you know, I keep the flame alive. I bring the logs, I bring everything. And then people are worshiping the same fire. And it's me who's in charge. A young boy, he was very young. So his father used to keep him in the home and within the vicinity, never allowed him to go anywhere. And he never ever interacted and mixed with people. To this very day, you have such positions I just watched the best ever food review show and there was a village in which they worshipped little girls. Yes, those little girls apparently were goddesses and those little girls were not participating within everyday society. However, when they grow up, all of a sudden they become normal people again, normal old women and they're not goddesses any longer. Makes sense. Hey, my father was very busy. So he said to me, listen, in one of my gardens, there is some work I need to do and I can't do it. 
So I'm going to send you to do this work and don't go anywhere else. Only go to that garden, do the work that I ask you to do and don't go to any other place and come back. Because if you do that, I will be consumed by worry. So he said, I went to that garden of my father's and on the way I heard some people, a nice voice of some people reciting something. So I went there and it was a church. These people were Christians. Seems that they were upon the right and the correct and authentic message of Jesus, peace be upon him. So he liked the hymns and the recitation that they were doing. So he joined them and he stayed with them for the whole day. And then I went back That's to my father, father without going to, to his garden. I found out that my father had spent the whole day looking for me and he was consumed by worry and fear and apprehension about me. My father said to me, where did you go? He said, well, actually I was going to the garden, but I saw some people on the way. They were reciting some nice things. When I went to join them, they were worshipping God. And I liked the religion they were upon and I stayed with them for the whole day. So my father said to me, now those people are evil, their religion is evil, your religion is better than them. I said, no, their religion is better than our religion. It's clear because wow. worshipping the fire, it's obviously to any person with a sound intellect, it totally contradicts every reason and every intellect. Of course it does. You can light up the fire and you can put it off again. You have control over the fire. This is what people that are into evolution claim all the time, right? We mastered fire. How can you worship something that you are the master over? When he noticed that, that he chained sense. him and he imprisoned him. He jailed him at home. He said, you can't okay. go out now. So he said, through some of my contacts, I sent to those Christians and I asked them, where is the origin of this religion? So they said to him, they are based in a sham. So I said to them, when a caravan comes to you from that land, from Syria, please inform me. Time passed by, one day a caravan came from a sham. He said, please, when the day comes, the day of, of their departure comes, please inform me. Somebody informed him, he broke loose from the chains and he joined them and he went to, with them to a sham, to one of the churches there. And there was a priest in charge of that church. He stayed with them and he said, listen, I came from that land and I left the religion of my fathers and my forefathers. And because I see that your religion is the truth, I want to follow it. It's the religion of God. So he joined them. That's an amazing story, man. But he said, I saw that this priest was an evil man. Mm -hmm. He pretends to be righteous, but every time he tells the people, pay for the poor people, pay for the cause of the religion. The people would pay from their gold and their silver and the wealth that they had, but he didn't give the money to the poor huge, people. Huge, huge issue it for within the church. He used to Corruption, hold it somewhere, he used to save it somewhere. On the Balkans as well, when I was Orthodox Christian and I promoted Orthodox Christianity on YouTube, I got a lot of backlash from my fellow Balkan people that left the church because they told me, those guys are hypocrites, why would we support them? Priests down here are driving Mercedeses and whatnot. They're bathing in money. Those guys are hypocrites. It is true Unfortunately. And I Not hated all, him so much, but I couldn't say anything about him. But there are a few. And one day, he became very ill, then he died. So everybody was getting ready to bury him and give him a respected funeral. So I said to them, why do you want to give him such a respectable funeral? They said he's our leader and our priest. He said, but he was an evil man. He, they said, how do you know that? He said, because I lived with him. And every time he commanded you to give charity, he would take it for himself and hoard it and save it somewhere. They said, uh, can you prove it? He said, yes, I can tell you where he kept all the money and all the wealth. He told them where that place was and they found a lot of wealth, a lot of silver and gold. He kept it for At himself. At least they found it. Then they brought another priest no, they could use it for to be in charge of the church. This new priest was such a righteous person, I've never seen anyone like him in my life. He was a devout believer, worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, and he would guide the people, teach them, and he would do so many deeds of righteousness. I loved him so much like I've never loved any person in my life. And I lived with him and I started learning from him. Then one day he fell ill and he was about to die. So I told him, I left my father and my family and my country in search for the religion of truth and I've lived with you 
Now you are dying. You know, tell me about a person that I can, I can go and join him and live with him and learn from him. He said, oh my son, you know, people have changed the religion of truth, the religion that Jesus came with. And I only know of a person who was in al Musil. That person is upon the true religion. It's quite amazing to see as well that even back in the day, of course, those people saw that somebody changed the religion. Nowadays, we're sitting here on our phones or in front of our computers and we're watching YouTube and then we see those debates between Christians and Muslims and we have the claim that the religion has been changed. But this is nothing new, of course. This discussion has been going on for thousands of years. This is so amazing to hear this story and to see that this struggle was real even back then. What is the true religion? So go and join him and stay with him. Once he, we, he died and we buried him, I left to Al Mosul and I joined that person and I found him to be even better than his friend, more righteous than his friend. And I spent a long time with him, learning from him, serving him, and getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said it was such a wonderful time for me. But then time came where this person also fell ill. Life is temporary, so he said to this to his go. teacher who was dying, he said to him, guide me to someone. He said, you know son, people have changed the religion. And I only know of one person who is in a city called Nusribin. So you join him and you learn from him. So he said, I stayed for some time after we buried him. Then I straight set out to Nusribin to join that person. And I found him even better than his friends, more righteous. I spent more time with him and I learned from him. And I loved him so much, more than I loved anybody before. Then he fell ill and he was about to die. When he was on his deathbed, I came to him and I said, I've left my family. What should I do? Where should I go? I need a sheikh. So he said to him, people have changed the religion. I only know that on earth there is only one person that I know of who is still on the true religion of monotheism, the religion that Isa alayhi salam came with. She said, where is he? He said, in Ammuriya. So he said, this person died. Then I traveled to Amuriya and stayed with that person. I found him to be more righteous than all the ones before. And I loved him so much and stayed with him for some time. Then after a while, he became very ill. And I could tell that he was dying. It's so repeating and repeating I and spiraling him, Show me, right? guide me to anyone that I can go and join. Righteous. I want to learn from and I want to stay with. He said to him, I don't know of any person on earth who is still on the true religion. But he gave him a good piece of news. Now it's time for a prophet to be sent with this truth. And he will be set in a land between two hills. And this land or this city will be full with palm trees. Then he died. She said, I stayed in that city, Amuriya, for some time. I worked and I managed to buy a cow and some sheep, some goats waiting for the opportunity and asking and inquiring to know what is that city, where is it? So I came to know that it seems that it was the land Arabia. One day there was a trade caravan from a tribe called Kalb, one of the Arab tribes. So I came to them and I said to them, can you take me to your land, to Arabia, and I will give you my cow and my goats? They said, okay. And we set out on the journey. On the way, they set me up. They sold him as a slave. Nah. Who bought him? He was bought by a Jew, so he became a slave to one of the Jews. What he said, a when that twist of Jewish events, person man. took me to his home, to his town, I saw many palm trees around. Hmm. So I was hoping that this was the land of the Prophet. Imagine he was taken as a slave. But still, his main concern was to find the Prophet or the, that city where the Prophet was to be sent. That was the main thought on his mind. He didn't think about him being set up and being, becoming a slave, losing his liberty, losing his self. He said, I really felt some happiness that this might be the city where this prophet will migrate to. 
He said, but I stayed with the, my master for some time. Then one of his cousins came from a city called Yathrib. And my master sold me to his cousin. And who was this cousin? The cousin was from Banu Quraidah. They had settled around Medina. So Salman, he decided, okay, I'm going with this new master of mine. Let me go. When he got to Banu Quraidah, he noticed the desert. He noticed the rocks. He saw the greenery, the orchards, and he was so excited. He says, Subhanallah, I'm sure this is the place where this messenger is going to come. And he was so happy and delighted. So he worked very hard for this master of his. And one day, Another cousin came in from al Madin al munawwara One of the Jewish people had come to see his master. And he was busy on one of the trees taking out some dates. And what happened is he heard this man say that, Oh, Al-Aws and Al-Khazraj, they will be destroyed. Look at them. They want to follow a man who's just come from Mecca. He's claiming to be a prophet. And he's claiming to say this and that. Salman says, I got such a pleasant surprise. I shook in a way that I almost dropped off the tree. And I quickly rushed down the tree and got to my master with his cousin. And I said, what did you say? Can you repeat it? And my master gave me one smack and sent me back to work. <laughs> he says, but I heard. They said that he is living in Quba. So mission, that man. night, very quietly, I took some dates. Why did I take dates? He says, that man in Amuriya, one of those Christian leaders told me that when the messenger comes, there will be clear signs that prove he's a messenger. He will not eat charity, but he will eat from a gift. And he will have a mark on his back, that which will be a seal of prophethood. When you see that, you know he is the prophet. So Salman al-Farisi, radiallahu an, he decided... Those people back then were so much more in tune. They would already know that prophets are about to appear. Nowadays, people are so disconnected. And I believe that we are even furthering this disconnect through our technology. Because we are always taking our consciousness, our intuition, away from what is important and onto our devices. We are distracted all day long. And this is why I believe most people lost their intuition completely. Take some dates. And he went to Quba. He he says, I saw this messenger. I looked at him. I was so excited. And I, I said, you know, you people are not from this place. I've brought some charity that I want to give you. These are some dates and I want you to eat them. So Muhammad sallallahu thanked him and accepted the charity and so on. And the Sahaba, some of them began to eat. But Muhammad sallallahu did not eat. Why? Because it was a charity. So Salman says, okay, that's one. One sign, done. So after a few days, he heard that Muhammad sallallahu shifted to Medina already ready he went to Medina with some more dates and he looked at Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam he says oh he told him you know what I've brought you a gift because I believe you don't eat charity so Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam took it gave some of his companions and ate from it so he said okay that's the second sign done after a few days there was someone who died and was being buried and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam was at Baqiyah assisting in the burial so Salman had arrived in Baqiyah and he noticed Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam between his clothing he was which again shows us that slaves back in the day were treated differently than slaves that we think about when we think about slavery. Some slaves like this man here were even allowed to travel. Think about it logically. If you were about to get enslaved and now your master tells you you can travel, would you ever get back to that master? Of course, nobody ever would. But back in the day, they would come back to their masters and work for them. So the relationship between the master and the slave was completely different. Even if you look into the Bible, you will see that Jesus praises the slave and tells you that the slave is better than the rich man because the slave only has one master but the rich man has as many masters as he has vices. Slavery back then was different and slavery back then was not looked down upon. This is why it is so hypocritical yet again when certain Christian apologists look at Muslims and tell them Oh, it's not bad because of slavery. Looking very Ridiculous. hard to see Doesn't that mark on his back where his shoulders are and he's trying to look where is the seal so Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa looked at him and noticed that he's trying to look at the seal of prophethood so he actually pushed his clothing off in a, in a way that the seal became clear when Salman saw it he began to weep and he kissed Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and he declared his shahada and this is why this person was called the seeker of the truth without bothering about him losing his own freedom Salman al-Farisi, the seeker of the truth. The Prophet ﷺ was happy that his companions listened to the story. <clears throat> now Salman al-Farisi has won the hearts 
of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ with such a zeal and determination to find the truth no matter what it takes. So the I Prophet ﷺ told Talman al Pharisee, free yourself. So he went to his master <clears throat> and he said to him, I want to free myself. After some negotiations, his master agreed to free him if he grows for him 300 date palms and if he gives him the price of 40 ounces of either gold or, sil or silver, the narration doesn't really specify. And that was such a huge price. But for him, it was to free himself and dedicate his time for the sake of Islam. So he came to the Prophet ﷺ very happy and he said, I agreed with my master on this. So the Prophet ﷺ said to the companions, help your brother. And here where the Muslim Brotherhood really shows its beauty, where the Muslims helped Salman al-Farisi and soon after he was freed. Absolutely, man. This is the beauty of Islam. And you see the same thing into this modern day and age. If any Muslim on YouTube asks for something, you see the Ummah getting together and supporting that Muslim. And this is how it started. So this value, this tradition has been kept to this very day. In which other religion do you see this? And he became a free person. None whatsoever. And he helped Islam in so many occasions. He was one of the greatest companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Amazing. And I didn't even know this but man. he was loved by the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He is the hero of the battle of the trench because when the kuffar of Makkah, they were thousands who were now coming to Medina in order to attack the Muslims. There was no way that they were not going to be entering Medina Munawwara. But Salman al-Farisi was one of those who said, Oh messenger, in Persia, when the enemy comes and we want to block him from coming, we used to dig a big trench approximately 10 meters by 16 meters. And we used to make sure that they cannot and yet again i have to stop this video and just think about the anti-islamic claims here how ridiculous this is they're always saying oh, Islam is so violent. but here you see a man that was brought up as a zoroastrian he was worshiping the fire he was responsible for that fire and then later on he goes on a journey of seeking truth and goes from one christian leader to the other committing to christianity trying to find that truth Ultimately, he finds Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, and goes to war with him. Did he then there complain about how violent Prophet Muhammad is, how bad war is, and this is evil, and this is not in the name of God? Of course not, because if you look into the prophets, if you look into Moses, for example, he of course went to war, he went to jihad, if you will. All of those talking points are not only flawed, but they are dishonest, of course. They are not representing what truth is they're an appeal to emotion of course what bad it hurts even in the bible you will find that there is a time for everything look it up there is a time for war as well just because war is brutal there is killing does not mean it does not have to be done even cross the trench so they don't enter the city at all so let us do it and subhanallah that was adopted by muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam hence it is called the battle of the trench why Be Salman al-Farisi radiallahu anhu, it was his idea and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala confirmed it for Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This was the young man from Persia. He has a story with Abu Darda radiallahu anhu. Abu Darda radiallahu anhu was another companion whom the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had asked Salman al-Farisi to live with when they came into Medina Munawwara after some time. So Abu Darda radiallahu anhu he became the fostered brother of Salman al-Farisi. Salman al-Farisi radiallahu anhu notices the wife of Abu Darda radiallahu anhu. She took no interest in dressing, no interest in any appearance, no interest in food or anything else. So he asked her, what is the problem? So she answered him saying, you know, your brother Abu Darda, he finds no need in this world, nothing, nothing at all, which means he's not interested in his wife. So. Salman al-Farisi waited for Abu Darda at night and when the night started he began to read long salah Salman stopped him and told him do you know what go and sleep so he went to sleep a little while later he got up Where's again he says go to sleep a little while later he got up again he says go to sleep and when the third of the night was remaining Salman got him up and said now if you want to pray you may pray then he said oh Abu Darda remember your body has a right over you 
your wife has a right over you, your family has a right over you, everything has a right over you. You must fulfill the rights of absolutely everything. And you don't have to overdo it when it comes to acts of worship of this nature. So Abu Darda radiallahu anhu listened to him because he was knowledgeable. But that is yet again the beauty of Islam because true Islam, the way that I understand it, of course I'm not a scholar, is about balance. It's not about going to extremes, extreme worship and then neglecting your family, for example, extreme fasting and then losing your libido and not being able to perform as a man. Islam is about balance. This is what happened between me and Salman. The Prophet says, Salman has spoken the truth. You must fulfill the rights of your family members and understand that too is an act of worship. May Allah make us from amongst Deep. those. Deep. Salman. Absolutely, he's correct here because God created everything with a purpose. The man has a purpose, the woman has a purpose, the husband and the wife have their own purposes over the children and towards each other, of course. So if this is created by God, this is the way that it should be, if you're following it, then you're directly, indirectly worshipping God. Al Farisi at some stage became the Amir of Madain. Madain is an area in Iraq and he was the Amir, but he did not change at all. The stipend he used to get on a monthly basis made up of approximately 5,000 coins. He used to give it all away. When they came to build a house for him, they knew that this man does not want a big house. So he asked the builder, what type of a house will you build for me? The builder says something that will shade you from the sun, protect you from the cold. When you stand up, it will hit your head. And when you lie down, it will hit your feet. That's how small it will be. He says, yes, now you know me. That's the house. And that is what they built for him. And he was the Amir of Madain. On one instance, he, he went, went out suffer. and there was a man who had come from a sham. And what happened is that man was carrying belongings and, and a lot of goods. So so Salman al-Farisi radiallahu anhu was the Amir, but they did not know this. He offered to help the man and he started carrying the goods. And this man says, oh, thank you very much. Jazakumullah khair and what have you. And as they're walking, they met a group of men who greeted him as the Amir, the governor of Madain. And they told him, assalamu alaykum, oh Amir. So this man from Asham looks, he says, who's the Amir? They looked, they said, the man who's carrying your goods, subhanallah. This was Salman al-Farisi, a simple man. It is reported that Subhanallah, one day he was cooking and baking. So the visitors came to his house and they said, where is your girl, the girl who works for you? He said, no, we sent her to do another task. And I am a person who does not give two tasks to the same person. They will do one thing at a time. May Allah grant us goodness. On his deathbed, he was crying. And when he was crying, Subhanallah, he asked for something. And his wife brought it to him. In it, there was musk. He said, when I die, I want you to spray this musk on me because the angels who come to take us, they love a good fragrance. He passed away in Al-Madain and he was buried very near to Baghdad. Up to this day, his grave is there. He passed away approximately at the age of late 70s, some say 78 years old at the time uh, of Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu. And it is reported that Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu attended the janazah. Wallahu alam, Allah knows best. But this was our hero, Salman al Farisi, radiyallahu anh, may Allah grant us a good lesson. All right, guys, and this is it for today's video. What a beautiful story about a real truth seeker. Somebody that did not care about his comfort, his traditions, his family even. He left everything behind to find truth. First, growing up as a Zoroastrian, worshipping the fire, leaving his overprotective father behind just to pursue truth, to find the truth first and foremost within Christianity. There he found beauty. There he found people that worshipped God alone, but as well he found hypocrisy. Nevertheless, his path did not stop there. He continued on. He wanted to find the real prophet of monotheism. Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him. On his journey, he got enslaved, but he did not care for his comforts. He saw it as a blessing, and it truly was, because him being a slave, he got transported directly towards Prophet Muhammad in Arabia. This is absolutely amazing. The quintessence 
essence of this story is, of course, we should not get discouraged by outward occurrences. This world is like an ocean. Sometimes you have a storm, you have big waves, and then after that it can become calm again. But this should not distract you of your path towards truth, of your path towards God, of course. And this is what Salman al Farisi did here, of course. He did not care about his freedom. He did not care about his comfort. As I said, he only cared about truth, and ultimately he found it. All right, guys, but this is it for today's video. If you liked it, leave it a thumbs up. And if you haven't subscribed already, guys, please do so. If you want to support this channel by a patron, for example, all the links are in the description box below. Thank you so much for your ongoing support, guys. As always, may God bless you all. Much love and peace.